blessed. Always blessed to come here. I feel like every time I come here, the, man, the Holy Spirit is just so thick here. The presence of God is so thick here. Always thankful when God sees it fit to use me, and that's my prayer. Lord, use me whatever way you see fit. Any kind of way, Lord. I'm just a, I'm just a vessel that I want to be used in the last days. And I keep praying, Lord, open dates for me to preach. And I have, I've never asked for a date so far, and he just continues to open them. And even Maybe. more often lately, even last Wednesday, I was able to preach to the, uh, at my home church on a Wednesday night to the adults. And uh, that was my first time being able to do that. And then the Lord had already gave me another date in December to preach to him. So the Lord's been doing really a, a great work in, in using me, and I'm just I'm very thankful for that. But uh, we're going we're gonna to start off in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. Y'all can hear me fine? I know sometimes I talk loud. I'm not gonna hold I'm gonna hold the mic, but first Peter chapter one, verse six and seven. The Bible says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, it talks about a, a short time, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. It's, it's, it's various or diverse trials, various or diverse testing is what he's talking about. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes. Though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And this was just a, a heavy message on my heart. I said, Lord, help me to deliver this message. Even whenever I was studying for that message last Wednesday, the Lord was impressing this message on my heart. And I almost changed and preached this message last Wednesday. And what it was, was the Lord knew that Matt would ask me to preach tonight. And he was already putting this message on my heart. But if there's anyone that I see in the scriptures that knew about the trial of your faith. I feel like that would be Peter. It's Peter that's writing this here. Peter is a man that was called directly by Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. He's just a fisherman. He's an ordinary man, but God used him to do extraordinary things. And he immediately, the Bible says straightway, he left, he left everything behind. He left what he had been doing. He left what he knew to follow this Jesus. And he went around with Jesus. As Jesus, they, they went and... Jesus, they, they're, they're proclaiming the gospel. They're proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus is, he's healing people. And Peter's seeing all of this. And people that, that, that couldn't walk were healed. And Jesus is opening blinded eyes. And he's unstopping deaf ears. And Peter's walking with him. And he's seeing all of this. Even Jesus, uh, he healed Peter's mother-in-law. I believe it was of a fever. And Peter, he's walking with him. And he's learning about this Christ. About this son of the living God. But all through the life of Peter, I see many times that he was tried, many times that his faith was tested, and many times he would pass that test. And in the same chapter, he would, he would fail. But there's one thing that I see from the life of Peter that I came to minister to you about tonight, and that's don't quit. Amen. Don't Amen. quit. Amen. Don't quit. Amen. Don't quit believing. Don't quit praying. Don't quit when you're in the trial, the trial of your faith. If there's anything I see from the life of Peter, it's don't quit. He continued to press on. He continued pressing on toward the mark. But I've come to minister a message to you titled, very simply, don't quit. Go to the Lord with me in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for another opportunity to preach the gospel tonight. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that the seed, which is the word of God, will be planted into the hearts of your people. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that they would be encouraged. Lord, I know that this isn't a big theological message, Lord, but I felt like you would have me to just come and to encourage the church. Lord, if there's someone here that's been struggling, if there's someone here that's ready to throw in the towel or they, they in a trial, they in a tribulation. They're walking through the valley and they feel like they're alone, Lord, but that this message would encourage them to keep moving forward with the plan of God, to keep moving forward, Lord, because your hand is at work in their heart. It's at work in their lives, even though many times we can't see it, Lord, but rest, bless the preaching and the teaching of the word. Open the hearts of your people to hear it, Lord, and to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> We're going to go through a couple of events in the, in the life of Peter. I just want to pull out a couple points. And again, I'm just I'm here to encourage you. Matthew chapter 14. Some of them we'll read and some of them I'll just tell you the story for the sake of the amount of scripture it would be. But if you remember in Matthew chapter 14, there was a story of Peter and the disciples there in a ship and the ship's being tossed. 
back and forth with the wind and the waves. There was a bad storm and Jesus was walking on the water and they seen him afar off, but they didn't know it was him. And they cried out with fear. They thought it was a ghost. They thought it was some other spirit. The thing, y'all heard me say this before, but the thing that had come to save them, they had thought it had come to kill them. And they're crying out and they, rec they end up recognizing that it's Jesus. And Peter says, Lord, bid me if it's you to, to come over and walk to you. And Peter, Jesus said, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking on that water to Jesus. And if you remember, he began to look around. He took his eyes off of Jesus in the midst of that storm and he began to sink. Folks, self is always insufficient. The moment that you look away from Christ and you look at the, the whatever it is that's around, you know what's going to happen? You, be, you, will, you will begin to sink. But you know what he said? He said, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. I realize I'm insufficient. I realize I'm inadequate. I realize I can't do, I can't walk on this water without you. And he said, save me. And the, Jesus immediately he reached out his hand and he saved him. And that word save is an interesting word in the Greek. It's sozo. To save, keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction. And it's the same word that's used in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that word, for by grace are you saved, for by grace are you delivered, for by grace are you protected, for by grace are you healed, for by grace are you preserved, for by grace are you or you made whole. There's only one that can make you whole. There's a puzzle piece on the inside of every one of us that we, many times we look to other things in the world to fill that puzzle piece, but there's only one that can fill it. His name is Jesus. There's only one that shed his blood for you. There's only one that went to Calvary because he loved you so much. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. If that's you tonight looking at yourself, if you've taken your eyes off Jesus, this man had the faith to get out of the boat and to walk on the water. And then right there, boom, he starts to sink. I see him on the up and I see him down and he's up and he's down. Let's go over to Matthew 16. We'll start at verse 13. I'll try to wait. I know I tend to go fast sometimes. It says, verse 13, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say you that I am? We got a man of God here that preached three different messages on this very thing. Who do you say that he is? And that's what I would ask you tonight. Who do you say that he is? If you leave out of here tonight and someone asks you, who, do you, who are you going to say that he is? Who is he? Is he your deliverer? Is he, he your protector? Is he your savior? Is he the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world and made a way for you to have a relationship with this covenant God and all that he did for us and his son? Who do you say that he is? Or is he just maybe a wallet that you leave in your back pocket? It's hidden where no one can see it. And I only pull that wallet out when I need it. And I use it and I, I pick it back up. If that's you tonight treating Jesus as a wallet, my goodness. He's so much. Listen to what Peter said. And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto you, but my father who is in heaven, and I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not overpower it. And there's a certain religion that's built a whole lot of what they believe on that verse, and I just, I guess you could say maybe a quick teaching moment. Peter in the Greek is Petros. It means a piece of rock. It's a fragment of a rock. Rock it's Petra. It's a massive rock. It's a, it's a large stone. Jesus is not saying that he's going to build his rock on Peter, this man that was born with a sin nature, just like you and I are. No. But what the, what, what the Father had revealed to him that I am the Christ. I am the Son of the living God. And that's what the church was going to be built on. It was going to be built on Christ, the Petra, the only one in the scriptures that you see that is the rock. He's not building it on a piece of rock. He's not building it on a man. But he's building it up on himself. Christ and Him crucified has got to be the foundation. It's always the foundation. Scrolling down to verse 21. 
Saul, this is in the same chapter. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, you are an offense unto me. For you savor not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. <clears throat> then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Peter had just said, You are the Christ. The son of the living God. And in the same in the same chapter, just a few verses down, he's getting rebuked by Jesus. Get thee behind me, Satan. How do you go from blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, to get thee behind me, Satan? Again, the ups and downs through the life of Peter. Peter was looking at this in man's perspective instead of God's perspective. We can't, our eyes are deceivers. We can't look at it through our perspective. We must see it through God's perspective. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, verse 33. The Bible says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of you, yet will I never be offended. And I feel like Peter right here, he's speaking boastfully. He's speaking pridefully. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, that this night before the rooster crows, you shall deny me thrice. You shall deny me three times. And Peter said unto him, though I, should, though I should die with you, yet will I not deny you. Likewise also said all the disciples. They all made these boastful claims. I'm never going to deny you, Lord. I'm going to continue walking with you. And if you remember right after this, Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane right before he would go to the cross. And Gethsemane means oil press. And the weight of what he was about to do with the cross is bearing down on him. And he's walking and he's praying. He had brought Peter with him and he told him to, to be praying. And Jesus is walking and the Bible talks about him. He's falling to his face as the weight of what he was going to do was bearing down on him. And he, he gets back up and said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Father, not my will, but your will be done. And he would continue on and he goes back to Peter. And they're sleeping. He said, pray that you don't fall into temptation. I'm about to be taken. I'm about to be taken by the hands of sinners. Pray that you wouldn't leave me. And he goes again and he's praying some more. Lord, it's, it's bearing down on him. And he says, Father, forgive them. But he says, Father, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Let that be my prayer, Lord. Your will be done in my life. But as Jesus is being pressed by this, blood begins to come out of him. When he was being pressed, that which was most precious to him, his blood always represents his love. As he's being pressed of what he would do, and he's thinking about you, and he's thinking about me, and he's thinking about how we're separated from God, but he's going to go, and he's going to remove the sin penalty. He's going to remove the penalty of sin so that you can have a relationship with God, so that you can come into the presence of God, so that you can approach the throne of grace to receive help in your time of need. And Judas betrays Jesus. With a kiss. And he called him friend. I just told Aaron this last. I didn't even notice. He called him friend. Judas, the one that betrayed him, he called him friend. And Peter pulls out a sword. And he chops, I think his name was Malchus. He's cho he chops his ear off. <laughs> You're supposed to be preaching. You're supposed to be telling people the gospel of the kingdom. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And you're over here trying to kill people. Peter, put your sword away. Put your sword away. You know what Jesus did? He put that man's ear back on. He healed him. Let me tell you this. How many times do we step out in our own strength thinking that God needs our help? Only to find out that he has to restore what we messed up. Amen. His last miracle from what I remember before Jesus' death was him healing this man's ear. This man Peter had been walking by him all that time and Jesus put his mess right back together. Put that sword away, son. I must go to the cross. I have to go to the cross. They got a lot of preachers today. They want to preach Jesus without the cross. If you do that, there's no plan of salvation. Amen. There's no plan of salvation if you separate Jesus from the cross. Come on, Peter. And Peter had followed Jesus. All the disciples scattered. 
And Peter ends up following Jesus when they brought Jesus to the uh, house of Caiaphas, I believe it was. And Peter is questioned three different times. And guess what he does? He denies Jesus all three times. And I feel like I'm all, every, anytime I think about Peter, I feel like people would think of that time. Oh, what about all the other things he did? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But he denied Jesus three times. And I feel like some of us would be like, I can't believe he did that. This man walked with Jesus. How could he do that? But how many times have we maybe did that? The Lord wanted us to. I'm preaching to myself now. The Lord wanted us or me to tell someone about Jesus. And instead I treated him like a wallet and I kept him in my back pocket. How many times have we did it? Probably much more than three times. All the times. Lord, let me feel what Paul said when he said, I am debtor. It's not even in this message. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is with everything in me, let, I'm going to preach the gospel to those of you at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. Let me feel what Paul felt when he said, I'm debtor. I don't owe a debt to God for my sin, but I feel like I owe him for all that he has done in my life to get the message out to tell people about this Jesus because he's just done so much in my heart he's done so much in my life but he had denied Jesus three times and Acts chapter 2 rolls around what a glad day they were all with one accord in one place praying and suddenly there came a sound from heaven the sound as of a rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues of fire began to set on the people as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And they started praying in tongues and they were baptized, speaking in tongues. And there were people that were there that were mocking. And they said, look at these folks. They drunk on new wine. Look at them. They all intoxicated on some kind of new wine. But Peter, after all them shortcomings and the ups and the downs, he stands up on the day of Pentecost and he begins to Preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that their hearts were pricked. Their hearts were pricked. That's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. When the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ and him crucified, when that is the focal point of the message, and the man of God, lady of God, is preaching that, it should cause us to take an inventory of what's on the inside of me. And the Holy Spirit ends up convicting me and showing me things that's in me that don't need to be there. This man stood up under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, even after all of that, because he didn't quit. And God used him mightily, and 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom because he didn't quit. He could have thrown in the towel all those other times, all them other times he messed up. I'm not dealing with this Jesus no more. But he kept walking with him and God ends up using him. And he preaches the gospel and those 3,000 souls were added. Thankful that he truly preached the gospel. Thankful for men of God and ladies of God that truly do preach the gospel in these last days. Because I feel like in a large part the church is more worried nowadays with accommodation. Instead of confrontation, we, many times we'd rather accommodate people in their sin and give them some coffee and give them some donuts and just come on in. We're not going to preach anything that offends you, sir. We're not going to preach anything that offends you, man. You can't get saved like that. You sit as a sinner in a church thinking you're doing something for God. If the man of God, lady of God is not preaching the gospel, thank God that he preached the gospel. And that those souls were pricked. And I pray that tonight your soul is being pricked. Or your heart, I'm sorry. It's being pricked as I'm preaching this message to you. And I'm praying that you would be encouraged. In Galatians chapter 2. If you would remember, it's right around verse 11. Paul rebukes Peter at Antioch. For standing for false doctrine. It wasn't even that he was proclaiming false doctrine. But when the Jews had come in, those of the circumcision... Peter began to separate himself out from them. Man, actions, actions so many times speak so much louder than words. It wasn't something that he was saying, but look at what he's standing for. He began, you know what he's, you know what he, that's showing? It makes it look like there's two bodies of Christ. 
No, we are all one in Christ, Jew and Gentile, all of us. But he began to separate out when the people came because he was worried about what they were going to think. And Barnabas even separated out from them. Let me tell you something. Your life preaches a louder message than your mouth Amen. ever could. Amen. Lord, help me that my mouth wouldn't out preach my life. People see our actions. It might not be that you ever stand in the pulpit, but you might be the only Bible that someone ever sees or that someone ever reads. Mm -hmm. But Paul is rebuked in front of everybody openly for standing for false doctrine. Another time that we see Peter just kind of wavering and, and, and not standing for truth, not standing for what he was supposed to be standing for. And I feel like I also see or uh, think about when old friends come around and we begin to slip back into our former lifestyle because we're worried about what they will say or think about us. That's what I see there. He knows these people. He knows what they're going to think. And he just begins to separate himself out and not stand for the truth of the gospel. And thank God Paul that day addressed it openly. Evidently, it is biblical if you have to rebuke somebody openly because Paul sure did it right there. I never come into the pulpit looking to bash anybody. I could probably say a few names of people that stand for false doctrine, but I don't, I don't come in the pulpit to do that. I just want to preach the truth of the gospel. And if there's something you've been listening to that ain't lining up, then the Holy Spirit will convict you and, and show you. Right. But again, if there's anything that we see from the life of Peter, it's don't quit. Don't quit. Keep moving forward. Amen. Keep moving forward and God will use you. God will use that. He wants to use you. If you quit tonight, all those people that you are supposed to be reaching with the gospel of Jesus Christ, what happens to them? It's not even that. You just gave up. But what about all the people? Aaron sees people on his job I will never see in my life. Many of you see people on y'all's jobs that I will never see in my life. People that you come in contact with at the grocery store. So if you've been struggling or thinking about quitting, it's not only you that could end up losing your own soul. But what about all the people that you have to be reaching? What happens to those people? Think about that. Don't quit. Don't quit. Everyone wants a testimony, but we forget about the first four letters of that word. Test. T-E-S-T, -E -T, test. We all want a testimony, but I don't want the test. You can't have a testimony unless you had a test. Amen. Man, I got a testimony. I, I told y'all this before, and I remember we shut the power down in Patterson, so I'm not going to say too, too much about it. <laughs> if the lights go out, I do have experience preaching in the dark, so we will keep on going. And I have an iPad now, so even if it does, I'll have my notes. Last time I didn't have no notes. <laughs> But I had a test years ago. I, I got born again whenever I was young, but I had never truly been tested. And when I was work, working offshore, I was, just, I was struggling at the time. I had a lot of things in my life that I needed to, to get rid of, really. Things that didn't line up with the gospel. Thing that, things that didn't line up with the will of God. Sinful things that did not need to be in my life. And I found myself in a very, very bad depression. And I went through that for, for months and months. There came a point I wasn't married to my wife yet. There came a point that I told her I didn't even know if I loved her anymore. We dang near didn't even make it, man. I was a mess. I was all messed up. But when I finally fell at the feet of Jesus and I recognized that my mom and dad couldn't help me. My grandma couldn't help me. Nobody else could get me out of it as much as all of them were praying. When I finally fell on my knees before the king, Jesus rushed into my heart. Jesus rushed into my life and he began to change me. And I found out, I found out my faith, my belief, my trust, all my eggs have to be in one basket. In business, they tell you, put your eggs in a few different baskets in case one of the businesses collapses. No, I'm talking about all your eggs have to be in one basket. Christ and him crucified. It is finished. That's the only message I need to hear. That's the only message that my belief, my trust, my dependency has to be in. And the Holy Spirit began dispensing grace into my life to overcome my sin problem. But if we don't understand that grace is to overcome our sin problem, we make the mistake that grace has the ability to live in my sin. And that is never the case. That is never the grace is to overcome my sin problem. It's unmerited. I can't work for it. There's nothing that I can do to earn the grace of God. There's no law that I can keep. 
It's by simple childlike faith that whosoever will believe the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth, come and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will take the water of life freely. It's simple childlike faith. Anybody, a child could come into the kingdom, but the Lord delivered me. And now that test, I came through it because I stayed under and I didn't try to go back the other way. I didn't try to figure out how, how I was going to get out. I just fell before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And Jesus came into my heart and I was truly changed. Even though I was born again when I was like eight years old, maybe I didn't even fully understand. I, again, when I, when I uh, went through college, I started living out in the world and doing things I shouldn't have been doing. And I opened up a door for Satan to come into my life and demonic activity or whatever it is that was going on. But Jesus saved me and I got a testimony about it because I didn't quit, because I didn't go back the other way, because I stayed under and I kept pressing forward. Amen. And there was times that I was so weak, but Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you, yeah. for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Yeah. There was times that I was weak. There was times I... There was one time offshore, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, even though it did shut the power out last time, I was offshore, and the Lord was leading me to say something to a group of about 50 or 60 men, and I'm sitting there fighting against it because I don't like to talk in front of people. I don't even know half the guys in the room, even though I've been out there for a year, and the, the Holy Spirit is, is impressing upon me to say something, and I'm fighting against it. Like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. No, Lord, let me go. Let me go. And all of a sudden, I heard these about three or four demons laughing at me. You can think I'm crazy, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You can think I'm crazy if you want, but I heard some demons laughing at me. Satan was laughing at me because I didn't want to do what God was asking me to do. And finally, I stood up and I raised my hand and I told those men, I told those men about Jesus, said anything, very simply, Anything is possible with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That is all I said. And the Holy Spirit moved on some of those hearts and he pricked it. And out of 60 people, maybe five or seven people thanked me for what I said. And what I'm getting at is I was weak at that point. I mean, the grace of God showed up. I seen it right there that his strength is made perfect in weakness because I did not know how I was going to say that. And the Holy Spirit used me and people thanked me. Their hearts were pricked. Because of that, you don't have to know 400 scriptures to share. If all you know is John 3, 16, say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If that's all you know, if you point someone to Calvary, if you point someone to the blood, the Holy Spirit will, will move Amen. and convict that heart. It's not, you don't have to keep on ministering to that person, making them try to believe all you have to do is share it with them. It's up to them if they end up rejecting it. But certainly don't write them off if you keep coming in contact with them. Keep telling them about the blood. Mm -hmm. But I never quit through that depression. What's up, Miss Yvette? Uh, did you want to uh, come play a little something, please? I never quit through that depression. And I want to encourage you tonight. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. We see the many ups and downs through the life of Peter, but he never quit. He continued to press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus. I've come to encourage someone tonight. Don't quit. I can't say it enough. Don't quit. Don't quit. If you've been struggling, if you're in a dark time, if you're in a trial, if you're in a tribulation, don't quit. Keep moving forward. Don't quit. God has not brought you this far to leave you now. He ain't brought you this far to leave you now. He hasn't brought you this far to leave you now. Four words, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. Whatever you might be going through tonight. It came to pass. Make sure you fight the right fight. If we end the ring with the devil tonight trying to fight him and we, we ducking and we weaving. No, man. All I have to do is fight the fight of faith. Yeah. That's all I have to. I have to fight to keep my faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary. That, that's enough. I don't need anything else. The blood of Jesus that poured out at Calvary is enough for me. There's no longer enmity between me and God. There's no hostility. 
I become a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. But I have to fight to keep my faith in what Jesus did. And that, that is enough. There's nothing that needs to be added to this. Nothing that you can do to add on to it. Get out of the ring if you've been fighting the devil in and of your own strength, in and of your own power. Get out the ring and say, nope, it is finished. It's finished. I said, it is finished. The Bible says you can come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help in your time of need. I can come boldly into the throne room of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to receive grace in my time of need, and whenever he sees, whenever God sees true faith in his son and what he did at Calvary, he will send grace. He will help you. Amen. God can work with failures, but he can't work with quitters. He can't work with quitters. If you won't quit on God, God won't quit on you. Amen. If you won't quit on God, God won't quit on you. I remember in the life of Jeremiah, it's in chapter 20, verse 9, if you want to go back and look at it later or whatever. But there was a time in the prophet Jeremiah's life. He said, I'm in derision daily. I'm being, I'm being mocked. I'm being spit on. I, I believe they were maybe even beating him bodily home, whatever was the case. But he, he ended up saying, Lord, your word's not going to be in my mouth no more. I'm done with this. I'm tired of dealing with this. I'm tired of walking in the calling that you called me to do. But he said, but I felt, I felt something rising up on the inside of me something that wouldn't let me stop he said but the word of God is in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones just waiting to come out just waiting on the Lord to call upon me and I pray that tonight something would rise up on the inside of you think back to the last time God showed up for you and he didn't leave you then and he's not going to leave you now if you won't quit I said if you won't quit I said if you won't quit the trial of your faith is only for a season. It's only for a short time. This life that we live is just a smidgen of time compared to eternity. You know, a goldsmith, whenever he takes that gold and he puts it into a crucible, a metal container, and he turns the fire up and he begins to heat it up and that gold liquefies and the dross comes out, the impurities come out. And he's able to wipe away those impurities off that gold. And whenever that goldsmith looks into that gold, whenever he can see, mirrored in that gold, the reflection of his own image. Y'all seeing that? When he can see the reflection of his own image, then he says, that's pure gold. And if you would stay under and you would keep on fighting and you would keep on going on and you keep your faith in Christ and what he did at Calvary, God will mold you and form you into the image of His Son. The testing comes to test your faith to see if it's genuine. If it's genuine, it passed the test. If it's not genuine, it was only temporary. But if you would keep pressing on, eventually God will look down at you and He would see mirrored in His. He would see mirrored His own Son. He would see His own Son. Because the potter's hand is at work in your heart, is at work in your life, and he's wanting to mold you and form you into the image of his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. So if you would keep pressing on, if you would keep moving forward, if you wouldn't quit tonight, God will mold you and form you into what it is that he wants you to be. So I've come to tell you, don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit, friend. Don't quit. Listen, bit, whatever you feel like you would be led to play, I just felt like this is the kind of message that I'd like to uh, have an altar call just for a few moments. If anybody been struggling, if anybody wants to come up and be prayed for, if you just want to come up and worship the Lord, whatever it is, I can tell you for myself, I have never went up to an altar call and wish I wouldn't have went. Even if the altar call wasn't for me, I've never went up and said, man, I can't believe I went up there. I didn't get nothing. No, man. Come to the cross. Come to Calvary. Come to the altar. Where the blood of Jesus poured out. Where things come to die. The altar is where things in your life come to die. But that old man can die. That old man, dominated by the sin nature, he was dealt with at Calvary. But if you wouldn't quit, whatever it is, if you have a song or whatever, Miss Yvette, if you'd like to play it, let's just we'll worship the Lord for a few minutes.